Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Dash, President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy, and welcome to the third event in our COVID-19 webinar mini-series. You can follow today's conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AllHealthLive or follow us at AllHealthPolicy. The Alliance gratefully acknowledges the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation for supporting today's webinar. Before we begin, I'm going to briefly orient you all to the GoToWebinar platform and review brief technical notes. First, to ensure the best audio-visual performance, please make sure you are dialed in using your phone and close all other windows that may be open. You should see an interface light that looks like this, and you can ask questions using the, uh, the question chat box. You can send in those questions at any time, and we'll address those during the broadcast. Finally, all of the materials that accompany this webinar, including a recording, will be available at allhealthpolicy.org. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Governor Mike Levitt. Governor Levitt is a distinguished public servant. He served as the governor of Utah for nearly a decade, as well as the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services during the George W. Bush administration. Governor Levitt, welcome. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, good day. Good day. Let me ask you, you have an incredibly unique vantage point as both a governor and as a former HHS secretary, and uh, you have in fact led through uh, pandemics uh, yourself. Um, can you explain to us the different roles of the federal, state, and local governments in responding to this outbreak? Yes, may I say, I, I think we have to start just, just an acknowledgement that we have all now begun to make, and that is that pandemics are a unique emergency. Uh, we have become accustomed uh, to government playing a role in an emergency. When there's a large hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake or a, a terrorist event, uh, we're able to deploy as a federal government to the scene with many different resources, most of which come from states. As we look at what a state, what a federal government has to deploy in terms of people, um, feet on the ground, if you will, most of those tend to be people from states who are not engrossed in the emergency itself. With a pandemic, everything is happening at the same time everywhere. And that makes this a uniquely uh, a uniquely local emergency. That being said, it's important to acknowledge that there's a role for everyone, especially the federal government. What are the roles of the federal government? Well, first, vaccine. We have great hopes of being able to develop vaccines and medicines that, in fact, diminish the symptoms or in some ways bring about healing. The federal government has that role. Uh, there are, of course, uh, the, there is the uh, capacity for the federal government to collect and spread risk through tax dollars. Uh, we're seeing now uh, work on the third supplemental appropriation to respond. Only the Congress, only the federal government can do that. There's the collection of data and the providing of information that has to come through the aggregation of data that's collected at the local level. No one would have that capacity other than the federal government to be able to create those kinds of data standards and aggregate the information. The federal government has supplemental assets that can be deployed in times of hardship. They have the, uh, the military and other kinds of things which uh, uh, could be, if required, um, deployed. So there is a very distinct federal role. But anyone who believes that the federal government can come to their rescue uh, by uh, its deployment would be somewhat disappointed, I think, because that has to be done for the most part by state, local governments who have resources on the ground. And the job primarily of the federal government, in my view, is uh, to meet its unique roles in being able to support what's happening on the ground. For example, let's take school closures as an example. The thing about a pandemic is that it unfolds differently in different regions of the country at the same time. And so we do see different responses being uh, taken by governors and by local mayors and county commissions uh, who have a, a view with, through their public health officials what should be done in those areas. 
There may be schools that do a soft close. There may be schools who close for a long period. There may be schools who have a limited schedule. It depends on the nature of what's happening. And of course, my advocacy is always for them to be making decisions based on local uh, public health advice. So Sarah, I think that gives at least a range of the government's role. But could I say, this isn't just a government response, obviously. There's a role for everyone. Uh, you'll hear me say over and over that families need a pandemic plan. And that's certainly true as we begin to see now uh, a lot of sheltering in place going on or whether we see people going through voluntary isolation. There's a role for businesses. Every business is now having to think through how they will uh, uh, accommodate this new and, and quite unusual situation. Churches, schools, universities, uh, institutions at every level uh, need to be thinking about their plan. So again, there's a role for everyone in pandemic planning. Thank you so much, Governor. Well, let's let's go to that because in the past, just in the past week to maybe 10 days, there have been really unprecedented steps taken at the state and local levels uh, to encourage this idea of social distancing to slow the spread of this particular COVID-19 pandemic and to flatten the curve. From your vantage point, how do you think those efforts are going? Do you think there's more that remains to be done? Do you have any concerns at this point? Well, I think we all have concerns. I think there's always more to do. But I do think we ought to acknowledge that what is happening among the American people is nothing short of historic. Uh, people are responding. This is hard. It's not something people would choose. There are lots of reasons not to do it. And there are some who aren't doing it as well as we could, I think, expect that they um, should do. However, we're seeing such a profound response with businesses working uh, from home, uh, with entire professional sport leagues and entertainment venues closing, with uh, families making preparations. This is a profound response, and it will save lives. And so I think we can, we can also acknowledge, and I think should, that there are so few times in a country's history where people pull together in a way that provides a, a sense of un unity. I think it's inspiring, for example, that uh, we have government now working together in a way that we have longed for uh, for a, a period of time. If three or four months ago, you could say Congress will be working together on a, in a bipartisan way to produce a common product, uh, that would have been unlikely. But in this moment of crisis, Americans are stepping forward. And I think it's demonstrating that that spirit is very much alive. Thank you, Governor. Well, you talked about uh, folks working together and, and coordination, and maybe you could shed some light um, from your, your former perspective at HHS about how um, how do federal agencies have to coordinate? We obviously have so many of them involved in different aspects of the response. Um, what, what needs to happen? What gets activated in a pandemic such as this? I think uh, this is uh, the reason that the president uh, chose to um, place at the top of the, or the, as chairman of the task force, the multi-agency task force, the vice president. That was a, an important symbol to say to the entire executive branch, we're going to work together in a, uh, a, a full government response. There's not an area of the federal government that is not required. If you're in labor, you've got a job. If you're uh, in commerce, you're on full, uh, on the balls of your feet. If you're at HHS, uh, you're working day and night. If you're at the Department of Education, uh, you have problems that you've got to deal with. If you are at state, you're working with other governments. If you're at treasury, you've got all kinds of new regulations and demands to put, for, uh, to, uh, put forward. If you're at energy, you're worried about the energy supply. Every department of the national government has a role here. And so without that kind of coordination, uh, it would become very hard, uh, difficult uh, to function. Now, I would argue, I would argue, I would at least uh, 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 make the point that uh, 
one of the criticisms that can properly be made of the way we organize and and particularly the way we appropriate uh, it's often difficult to collaborate across uh, line items even within a budget and so i would to those who are listening who have some influence on the way legislation is written for appropriation keep that in mind uh, there's a need for federal agencies to work together, but that means that they also need at points at points in time to contribute uh, jointly to projects that uh, can be for the common good. Thank you. That's such an important point. And it does indeed seem like th there is such an unprecedented amount of interconnectivity between obviously what we're seeing with the, the public health, with the epidemiology, with the health system preparedness, with the economy as schools and businesses have to close for the time being. Um, so, so it seems like there's, there's just this unprecedented amount of, of coordination. Um, you are also obviously now in the private sector and, and we've heard you know, private entities also stepping forward. What is the infrastructure in place to ensure that the public and private sectors can coordinate to execute uh, a more comprehensive response that we need? I think people are innovating right now uh, because that is not an area that I would say is particularly strong. Um, I have been on a, a number of um, different large video conferences uh, where uh, people are struggling uh, to come up with information that allows them to model what their new future looks like. All of us are coming to the conclusion we're going to have to operate in, a, in an environment we have not been accustomed to. What does that look like? What? And so I, I think that's an area that we'll undoubtedly see more focus on in the future because uh, people are struggling to even know what to do. I was just... Um, talking with a friend of mine uh, who runs a small uh, shop uh, in at a uh, at a at a, at a uh, golf course and he was saying I you know I, I don't know what to order I don't know if I should order anything I don't know if I'll uh, see customers in in April or May or June or July and it has a big impact on giving people assumptions giving people the degree of certainty possible uh, is an important role that I think uh, public policy makers and uh, those who serve the public uh, should keep in mind. Thank you, Governor. Do you, do you think there will ever be a going back to the way things were before? Do you think there will be some lessons that we learn um, going forward, some innovations that maybe take hold, or is it too early to tell yet? Well, I will say generally, and then I'll answer your question specifically. When you study pandemics, um, as I have, you begin to realize that pandemics are reshaping events. Uh, the economics of a nation, uh, of the world, uh, become reshaped. Uh, the politics are affected. Uh, the sociology is affected. Uh, business practices are affected. Uh, I, I, this morning, uh, I, I live in the West, and so it, it is still mid-morning, and I've, I've done three uh, video uh, conference meetings, um, and it's working out okay. We're learning to use that tool in a way that we hadn't before that technology existed, but I have a feeling we're going to see a lot more of that kind of communication, and that will begin to shift the world economically in a way that uh, it wasn't before. We're learning new skills. I, I think that we're going to see, I think we're likely to go through some re, some rough economic times uh, in the next uh, couple of months. And um, as we do, um, we're going to be reminded of, uh, of, of getting back to basics. And uh, during times of prosperity, sometimes we uh, begin to feel a little too entitled. Uh, I think our attitudes are going to be adjusted uh, in this process as well. Well, Governor, that, that um, dovetails perfectly with a question we've actually gotten in from the audience, which is uh, whether you have two or three suggestions on what individuals can do from home to support our government and help out 
the community during these times? I think the best thing we can do is be as prepared as possible to take care of ourselves. This is a place where self-reliance pays off, not just for individuals who are not dependent upon government, but it also takes the burden off of the government uh, so they can pay better attention uh, to the details that they are, that they uniquely can accomplish. Well, what does that mean? Well, I think it means that we follow the guidance that we're being given, number one, that we actually do practice uh, social distancing in the best way we possibly can. Now, all of us know what the parameters of that have become. Uh, to the degree that we have prepared, we have ample supplies in our home uh, in order to feed us and medicate us when we're required, when we're in the ways that we've been prescribed. Uh, that's a very good thing. It means there are fewer of us that are uh, shopping at any given moment. So I think that's uh, one thing we can do. I think the second thing is that we acknowledge that this is a very trying time, but it is going to end and that we need to remain as optimistic as possible and deal with what's in front of us and, and move forward. This is not a time for panic. It's a time to prepare. It's a time for us to do, to innovate and find ways to make, uh, make uh, to make things work. I, I would say, uh, lastly, I, I think it is if we follow the rules of hand washing, simple kinds of things. I, I, it almost seems uh, elementary to keep talking about that, but when we follow those rules, we're doing something good for ourselves, but we're also doing something very good for society. Thank you. Well, let's talk about another population that's really going to be affected by our individual choices, and that is health professionals uh, who are at the front lines right now uh, preparing for, you know, a, a surge in, in more serious cases who are at the front lines um, treating people. Um, can you talk a little bit about health professionals and what help do you think health professionals can expect from the federal government and from state and local officials? And, you know, as we know, of course, on Wednesday, um, President Trump invoked the Defense Protection Act giving the federal government broad powers to address uh, supply shortages, which we know have been a challenge. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, how our country uh, needs to help health professionals at this time? One of the most challenging aspects of planning for a pandemic condition um, and exercising uh, to prepare uh, was the allocation of scarce resources. And we will see that unfold over the course of time. Let's just take something that is not, has not yet occurred, but at some point will, and that is the development of, vac of a vaccine. A vaccine, uh, we hope, will uh, appear. We hope that it will be available widespread uh, or, or, or universally. However, it's not likely that it will all come at once and there will have to be decisions made. Of, if you have a limited number of dose, doses, where do they go first? And then, the, so the policymakers will need to develop a list of priorities. And typically that will be those who are uh, uh, caregivers uh, in, in hospitals and in physician offices and other places where sick uh, people turn for help. They need to be uh, uh, the first place. The second would be at-risk populations and so forth. But we have to acknowledge that those who are putting literally their own safety at risk to help us need to be the most protected. I think we'll also, I think we should also be tailoring uh, uh, some of the supplemental appropriation help that we get uh, to be focused on those individuals. They are giving not just of their own time, but they're putting themselves at risk. And without it, we could not be in a, we would not be in a position to constrain the destructive potential of this pandemic disease. Thank you. And certainly um, in a related way, um, could you talk a little bit about the role of HHS as well as the governors and the military to help with procuring the supplies and equipment that we need? What, what kinds of things do you think need to happen going forward beyond the, the supplemental appropriation, as you mentioned? 
Well, again, I think it's important to sort of keep in mind the construct of the way uh, things operate in public health. Uh, the federal government has taken a, a significant role over the course of the last uh, decade and a half or two decades, mostly because the states have uh, seen Medicaid expenditures going up so dramatically that one of the areas that they have begun to cut back on is public health, and uh, therefore the federal government has tried to supplement that. Uh, that underinvestment is in some ways uh, the, the effect of that we're, we're now seeing. But public health is both constitutionally, but more importantly, functionally, is very much a local function. There are city and county public health departments which have a delegated authority from the state. Uh, the state is then turns to uh, the federal government uh, for uh, guidance and assistance. But uh, public health is at its root a state function. So the role of the federal government will be, for example, uh, like CDC. Uh, CDC has been given some policy role, but for the most part, it's to offer guidance to the states and to coordinate the action across uh, the country. They possess assets that the state themselves could not uh, be, be able to uh, uh, pr uh, provide. So the, the, the role between governors and, and HHS in particular is very important. Uh, in essence, uh, while it, it, it's a kind of shared responsibility, there are times when the federal government is acting as primary and there are times when the federal government is acting as secondary. And in those cases, as when it's secondary, the federal government is there to be a, of assistance. When they are primary, uh, their role is, uh, is to provide clear guidance. Uh, we, some of those areas where they would be primary would be CD, uh, would be the, uh, the development of standards for data. That's a primary area. Another one would be the approval of medicines and vaccines and the coordination. That would be an area where the federal government is primary. So we, we have a relation, the relationship has to be both pliable and it has to be uh, uh, efficient because uh, there's not just, it's not a single relationship, it goes both ways. There's primary relationships for both and there are secondary relationships for both. Thanks, Governor. So uh, we're getting close to the end of our of our time here. So I want to um, kind of round it out with a couple of, of, additional, of additional questions. And when you talk about the role of states and, and their Medicaid programs, uh, we know some states are making changes to their Medicaid programs or calling for um, some additional uh, federal matching funds to, to um, address the crisis. How do you think states should be thinking about their Medicaid programs right now? Um, as we think about this pandemic? So um, let's just again start with a acknowledgement that Medicaid is a state federal partnership. It's not only funded in partnership, but the capacity of the states uh, is in, because of that partnership is in large measure dependent upon the federal government guidelines. So the, the, the one of the areas will be what um, what is the capacity of a Medicaid um, state Medicaid system uh, on co-payments? Uh, what type of uh, what about testing? Will that be covered? Uh, those are just two very simple expressions of this. There will be a need for the federal government, HHS or CMS, uh, uh, to provide the um, license, if you will, for the states to amend their their benefit plans. And that's beginning to help. So there's an area where both the federal government needs to act and then the states need to act. Just because the federal government acts doesn't mean that the states have to. But it, when this federal government says, look, we think that every test ought to be paid for, it's likely to require uh, the federal government to, or the state governments to amend their plan to do so. So there's a, a both a legal and an interpersonal working relationship that, that has to exist. Uh, we will. We've seen this recently in Medicare. Now, Medicare is a little different because that's clearly a federal program, but there's a need for telemedicine, for example, uh, 
and the, and this and literally yesterday the president and uh, and CMS and HHS announced that they're going to clear a whole series of regulatory uh, questions that have been in place about payment for telemedicine. That's a, a very important development. And I might add, you asked earlier about changes that will occur during this pandemic that we won't go back on. This is one of them. Uh, there's been a need for us to clear the pathway for physicians to operate across uh, state boundaries that's been a hindrance uh, to, to telemedicine. That's been cleared out now. That's the kind of thing now that I don't think we'll ever go back on. We'll begin to see telemedicine become a much greater part of the functioning of the American health system as a result of things that we're learning and doing during this pandemic condition. Well, thank you, Governor. I want to um, ask you sort of to look, looking forward just to the next week. So much has happened in just one week uh, with, with the flattening the curve, the efforts to social distance. Um, obviously, unfortunately, the number of cases continues to rise uh, as, as we look forward. Um, and things are moving at lightning speed. Congress has already passed two bills. They're looking at a third. Um, you know, the CDC, the NIH, CMS, FDA, um, and as you mentioned, all of the other agencies that are, are not specifically health are, are all um, firing on all cylinders. What do you think are the most important things for us to look for as we, as we look to the news in the next week? Well, well first, uh, Congress is obviously working feverishly to um, do the job that they believe needs to be done, which is to arm those dealing with this uh, with, with the tools they need. Congress as an institution, uh, I'm, I know they want to get this done, but one of the reasons they need to get it done is because they need to get out of town and get home and start doing the same thing the rest of us are doing for their own safety. A number of members of Congress and their staff, I think, have tested uh, positively now. Uh, that's to be expected. It's just a biologic fact that if you have as many people gathered together trying to do good work, even though they're being careful, it's going to begin to spread. And that could be, in the long term, a debilitating problem if, uh, if suddenly the institutions of the legislative branch have a hard time functioning. So there's a very good reason nationally and a very good reason for them personally uh, to get this job done and to be able to then uh, re return to their, their home districts. And so I, I, I believe we'll see that happen. I think the second thing we have to be, we have to just be ready for is we're going to see a sharp increase in the number of cases. And I, we don't know how long this will last. We don't know how high it will go, but we do know there's going to be a sharp increase and we ought to be prepared for that. And we're doing everything I think in local communities too ready for that, uh, to be ready for that. And how long will it be before we know if our social distancing efforts have have uh, worked? Uh, I think the pro uh, public health professionals have made clear we probably won't know with certainty for seven or eight weeks. And why is that? Or six or seven weeks? It's because historically, when you model these out, there's a, when when they get the big uptick on the hockey stick, if you will, uh, those generally will go through six or seven weeks to get to their peak. The speed at which it goes is dependent upon the success in social distancing. So if we begin to see those peaks be just a little lower than they might have been, if they're a little longer than they might have been, we will know that we have succeeded and we're going to have to be prepared to sustain this. And I would suggest that anyone who has the hope that this will end in the next two to three weeks, I, I, I fear will be disappointed. I think we're in for a longer ride than that. And uh, that's not just my opinion. I think that's what we're hearing from public health officials as well. So we need to settle in and be ready, but to recognize this is going to end. And uh, I, I would also, Sarah, like to, uh, uh, toward our conclusion, I'd like, I'd like to just say, I, I see through all of this hardship, very powerful, um, sociology taking place here. Uh, this, is, this is humbling our country in a way that could, can be unifying. 
I'm talking to friends. I'm hearing about their calls and outreach to relatives and people I haven't spoken to for a while. I'm hearing people talk about the way they're playing, reading, talking, interacting with family members that has not been possible in the past. Uh, I'm hearing people reach out to help their neighbors. There is a, a sense of humanity that we're all sharing in this process. And I think it can, can in, the, in the final analysis, uh, there will be positive things that come out of this hardship. In the course of that, we obviously have to face the hardship, but let's also take full advantage of the opportunity to change our lives in a positive way. Well, thank you, Governor. That is a wonderful note to end on. We thank you so much for your insights and the benefit of your experience as we all grapple with this uh, with this, and hopefully uh, go into the weekend thinking about that shared sense of humanity as, as we all deal with this. So, Governor Levitt, thank you for joining us. To our audience, thank you for joining us. Please do stay tuned for announcements about additional programming on the coronavirus crisis, which will take place next week. And to all, please be safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Governor. Thank you.